Um, I would love, I really love to share with you uh, an interesting point that um, I recently came across, and I was very interested in the different sets of games that were played between great players. And uh, as uh, some of you probably know, Bobby Fischer and Anatoly Karov never really played. The reason why never never played is because their match in 1975 failed. And there was this very interesting article I came across very recently about um, Karpov and Fischer. Like, what if they did play? And more importantly, what if they did play in uh, a different universe, in a parallel universe where basically they're could have been uh, this, um, you know, match that actually took place in Zagreb 90, 1975. Uh, so the author of that article actually provided four games that I found incredibly amazing. And even though I uh, cannot say that, like, where you got those games from, I mean, uh, whether you actually believe in, uh, uh, in that kind of stuff in parallel universes or not, I, I found this amazing because it was so close to the styles of each of them, and I believe if they really got to play um, in our universe, then th these games would have actually looked very similar to that. So I would very much like to share those with you. Now, keep in mind, that's just from an article I found recently, but I was so fascinated by the, the quality of these games. The author mentioned that this was the game one of the Hypo Universe number 337591, where uh, Carpo played with the white pieces versus Bobby Fischer. And uh, basically the game started with knight f3, c5, and pawn to c4. Uh, it's kind of exciting because then we see basically Carpo did go for the English uh, or would have gone for the English type of setup. And again, keep in mind that this is um, a really instructive example. I'm not saying that there is, you know, I think that these players would have played exactly like that. But, I mean, if they ever played in some different universe, I think that these games are very closely resembling what uh, would have happened. Or maybe, who knows, maybe the author was actually a time, tra time traveler who could go back in the past and uh, actually witness those games and take them. Anyway, going up, the Benoni... From Black's perspective, looks fine. Black played knight a6, g3, and knight x to the c5. White develops with bishop to the g2, knight f6, and knight c3. So, this is a very decent position as white is developing as well as black. And the more important thing is we realize that white's actually set up to get out. Maybe he can bring out his dark square bishop, he could set the queen up, and then do things well. Black plays d6, rook e1, and bishop to the e6. An interesting thing here is that black is definitely developing his pieces in order to create different sort of challenge and shot uh, versus white's position, like against a c4. And so there comes this really interesting question that is, how is white supposed to play? White does a powerful knight d5 move. It's a really interesting move because it changes the structure, but it also creates a powerful imbalance as the knight now sits in the center, opening the bishop and basically guaranteeing white a slight amount of extra space. Of course, black doesn't want to allow this, and bishop e4 is an incredibly smart move. You can see the first thing about any position and its evaluation is a structure. You don't want to focus on the structure in terms of how does it accompany all the variations that follow, but rather how does it affect the pieces and the potential plans. From the very beginning, every great player knows that if you get the right structure, you have a perfect game. Or if you don't, you're going to have a problematic game. So everybody really fights to get the right one. And this is where the really interesting and exciting battle appear. For instance, after the black move of bishop to e4, in case white plays f3 in attempt to drive back the black bishop, he could do knight d3. Pawn takes, bishop takes d4, exchange, and bishop takes d5, which would really come across as killer. Naturally, we could do the move of bishop takes to d4, and after knight takes d4, there is 
F3. So this is what uh, like happened in the game. Exchange takes and then F3. Seriously, White is getting the rid of the bishop, but he now created certain weaknesses around the king. And Black, let's say, plays a Fisher type of move, Queen A5. Instead of retreating, the point being is that if White takes the knight, Black would easily take the D4, and then the rook on A1 is hanging. So surely the knight retreats. Black gives a check, King G2, and there follows Queen F2 with a check. And so what you get to see in this case is something quite exciting. I mean, it looks like black almost destroyed white's position. And yet, the whole point of white's provocative play was to really, really force this queen to get in there. So now, once the black knight removes itself towards f6, white can do e3. And this, in a way, explains why you want to be very careful when you start attacking and that quite a bit of preparation is very needed, is very necessary, so you have that build up. Otherwise, it's just this is gonna just go to pieces. And you know, like so in some way we feel like the black queen and almost every other piece that he's got around are really not that well placed. So black plays now he's there's a problem. I mean knight takes d5 is a possibility because of the rook. And yet after bishop d2 takes rook f1 the queen is trapped all the sequence is going to lead to three pawns but as i've mentioned a lot of times previously uh, pawns are only important when they're powerful passers or when they're very advanced in some cases when they're restricting the opponent's pieces but black's pawns are neither so it's uh it's kind of difficult he plays g5 and that's a beautiful move Fisher was very famous in, in, in the 1970s about his ability to um, adopt a very quick counterplay. And even in some impossible to defend situations, find incredibly uh, uh, you know, advanced moves to keep up with the attack. White goes with e4, and you know, in spite of rapidly changing the situation, Karpov uh, you know, like would keep his nerve, getting the bishop out, and then surely uh, we could see now that g4 doesn't work now you may be wondering okay why did white now play rook f1 it was because of the g4 f takes g knight e4 and so in case of uh, rook takes ft obviously black is going to take back and on the other hand there's knight g5 check so it's like e4 h6 stabilizes what tries to cut off the queen again so as black wasted the move to protect the pawn and uh, we could see that this is actually very good for rook c8 there's bishop e3 and rook b1. White's actually going to go for a fantastic way to, uh, you know, like seize the initiative. And before we know it, the amazing activity of the knight and the rook is going to come down and destroy black's position. So that was powerful. Black plays rook fc8. And in the game, white does rook e2. It almost looks like, okay, white is winning now. This is what happens in the game. The queen is trapped, and there follows knight g4. I mean, when I was like, when I saw those moves, I was like, wow, this is beautiful. We have a, a possibility for black to defend the queen due to knight xf2, and also a discovered attack towards the d4. Essentially, the idea is that white almost lost his advantage, but then he plays king takes g4. In case of the exchange of queens, white can now seize the initiative with a move of h4. And now we have a roughly double-edged, but maybe we could say a little bit equal position. So white sets up f4. The idea is before black has gotten the ability to consolidate and improve his rooks, white wants to attack faster, takes, takes, and then black sees this and gets over with the rooks. Again, it's very difficult to talk about mistakes because this is a high quality play of a top level player. So that's why I was saying like if Fisher and Karpov could see this, they would be proud if this was their uh, you know their own game played in this universe. If it was like played in another universe and we had a time traveler who actually really witnessed this game, that was good. I mean, I believe in that kind of stuff. Maybe some of you would too. Uh, but that was really exciting. I mean, this is a game that uh, picks up, so white actually plays f5, challenging the pawn, and then, of course, there is bishop takes to the h6, 
Uh, and this was a little bit of a mistake, but only, like, I'd say one of the only ways for White to fight for advantage. It's taking the pawn and then going back. However, Black used the tempo. Now, when it, whenever there is material that well, that is lost, usually one gets an extra tempo. So now Black uses the extra tempo to cut off the White King, leaving it with a huge weakness, and then bring over the rooks, creating a very serious, if not lethal, threat of a checkmate. Of course, the only way for white to do that is to try and get rid of the g-file. Rook g2 makes good sense here, but then black's rook comes down to c2, and after that, rook takes the b2. And I'd say that black is slightly better, and yet it's almost impossible to win this. A couple of moves time, and white was able to quickly activate the rook. So by the time black captures the a-pawn, white already has the e. He's able to get back and even create a pass pawn just in time before black grows on the queen side and makes everything. The two key things in the end game always happen to be the peace activity and pass pawns. So you might want to actually know that it's all about how you get the right peace activity and how you set up the right pass pawns to help you. It was um it was a wonderful um you know resource to to see to see this happening at that point in the game. And even now black is still going to be at a trap because if he relies heavily on those couple pawns then white's own pawns will be a disaster to black, helping him to promote and catch. So um, there's the rook f4, rook a1 possibility, king on e3, capture, and then of course this is what comes out as this very tense moment is the draw. I mean, if they did play, if if black, if, if this game was really happening in our universe. I would love to see it, but even now I'm still loving to see it because it's very strong positional versus the dynamic play, which both Karpov and Fisher were great at. Incredible intuitive positional approach by White trying to create an imbalance and a very powerful counterattack by Fisher, who was brilliant, you know, in the in his young years. Um, he was brilliant at dynamic chess, exploiting every single opportunity despite the masterful command in White's army. Knight g4 followed by this whole exchange led to a, a tactical sequence which in the end really ends up with a beautiful draw. So that was basically the first game. Now the second game that was provided by, um, by, this, by this author, now again for those of you uh, who really don't know too much about parallel universes, it suggested that, you know, like whatever has happened in our universe may have a different result, you know, in a different universe. So if we could say that Carpenter and Fisher never played in this, in this earth, maybe they did play in the same time in a different earth. So essentially they could have played those games and maybe if they figured, if, you know, if we have a time traveler who actually passed and visited, um, you know, through these uh, universes. You could have seen those games, recorded them, and brought them back to us so we could see them and how they were, how they, how they happened. Of course, that's all theory. But, see this one. Black goes with his favorite Karakhan defense. And now, of course, White sets up Knight C5. Now, this is well known as Vischer actually played this move in quite a few games. Mostly, like, Simul's, though. But it's an interesting, you know, experiment of playing this. And Black, of course, goes for a strong counterattack of e5. Not backing down or letting the white knight provoke certain weaknesses, but rather attacking or countering the center in a beautiful way. Takes on b7, leads to queen b6. The knight jumps back. There's edicts to the d4. And this kind of illustrates the idea of early attacks. Early attacks almost never work because through the proper and very active positional moves, one can counter and make sure he stabilizes the position. But now, white wants to use another factor. Because of black's early passivity, this sort of exchange sequence just doesn't quite feel so right. And as these few trades do take place, White's quite capable to deliver his knight on f3, bring pressure to the d4, and actually make sure 
that he develops faster. Good thing is the black actually figured out the same. And as he maintained that strong stability in the center, black gets the castle on the short side and then plays a very powerful prophylactic move of h6. Now, the important thing about positions like that is not to just make sure you're stable. See, players like Karpov usually knew that all you need is a stable position that you could grow. And actually, if you could find a way to grow the position and make it a little bit more powerful, you could make more out of it. Otherwise, it's not going to be that stable for too long. The move of a5, finding a way to realize a4 as a threat, and plenty of other moves would have been incredibly helpful. Uh, it's, it's a great move that actually did happen in this game, because in case of any other move, white would have just expanded. So black plays a5, a4, bishop g4, <clears throat> queen d3, and so we suddenly realize that this position is more than what we could actually talk about. It's like a good protection that white is able to keep. And as black plays with d to the c and queen to the c3, we've got a really nice line for our bishop. We've got a really nice line for our knight towards c5. And we've got black fairly passive or backward with plenty of those pieces on the downside. Black doesn't exchange, takes. <clears throat> and, and so this is an incredible moment because uh, something I want to tell you is that in many, many occasions, players like Karpov and, uh, you know, Botvinnik and Smyslov, great players of positional play, knew that the urgency in any position comes from the potential risk. So whenever there's a risk for you to remain with weaknesses, like the C5 that White even threatens to take or so, you've got to approach things really fast, otherwise it's not going to work. And now Black does it very effectively, because after the exchange in ninety five, he delivers the trade on c4 and sets up rook b8. So before White has even gotten the chance to consolidate his advantage, Black takes over the initiative on his side and sets up an incredibly powerful simplification. <clears throat> c4 lets the pawn go, but then b2 is going to fall. <clears throat> and then, of course, we see exchange. Surely white would like to get rid of the black queen. He takes a5, black takes b2, there's rook a2, there's rook takes a4, f5, f4. Black has weaknesses, but everything is rather stable, and the position is uh, wonderfully solid. So we could say that this is a peaceful game, but with incredible, uh, you know, like breaks from each side. Now, in the... In the third game of the parallel universe match between Kerr, Kerr and Fisher, um, there's a this really <clears throat> interesting uh, fight. There's the battle, and I was very excited to see, just in terms of a high-quality game, just like that. Um, this was a game that Carver what did with the played with the white pieces, and uh, essentially after D, the C4, D to the C, Knight of three, and E3, he captures castles. Knight c3. Now, usually we know that it's always good to play open games like this because there is really where we have the fist fight between two great players trying to outplay each other. And despite all the theory, there are so many different, uh, you know, like unknown moves. So basically, both players are following through. And at the time, the move c4 was a novelty. Setting up for a nice attack instead of just going for the standard knight takes d5, which could be interesting, and yet it leads to forcing lines that are fairly well known. Black plays with c4, takes, captures, bishop c2 and bishop d6. If you stop to evaluate a position like that, which you should do in a more complex game of this kind, um, you should actually think about the character first, a very dynamic position in which essentially we could say that the activity matters more. Black has gained space and pretty good activity. His drawback though, which sort of equalizes the position and makes it fairly balanced, is that Black's king is in the middle and plenty of his pieces still feel like they're not ready to conclude any different or huge threats. That gives White an opportunity to set up A4. <clears throat> and this is the kind of move that is brilliant in its way of setting up 
um, setting black down in a bad position. With the move of a4, white challenges black so that if he, you know, if he plays castles, there will be an exchange and knight takes to the b5. So white challenges black to begin complication he is not ready for. So black accepts the challenge, and now it's a definite fist fight. A sacrifice of the knight for an incredible positional play, uh, so, uh, uh, positional pressure, is really what anybody would like. And yet there is no clear way on how white could create immediate threats, which gives black just the right amount of time to push white back by driving his queen and activating his own. Now we have a fairly critical position in which the major question is how do you turn this position, this fading attack, into something that can be maintained over time? And now this is where the transformation takes place. Instead of relying on a heavily attack tactical attack, which most people would like, and this is there's just no way to go on this like this. Uh, you could think about a positional pressure, which will help you to continue whatever it is that you thought. White street pawns are no factor here, and yet <clears throat> they provide for an opportunity that white could just use the temporary momentum in order to continue and pressurize black's pieces. By the time black castled, white creates a move of a5 that sets up the a6 on a passive back backside position, the pin on the c5, and the very active rook that are all together beautifully. In one move or another, the two bishops, the two rooks, and the brilliant extra tension turn out absolutely incredible. And as you can see, that this was, uh, uh, you know, th this almost gets bad for black. Yet, knight d5 comes. It's proven that activity can only help you, no matter what it is that you're doing or what position you're going for. And so in this case, black chose to set the knight over and take back with the bishop. Check, king e8, takes, exchange, capture. With all these exchanges, finally black reaches down for the c3, which really allowed white to play bishop to the d6. The, p, the b pawn looks awfully threatening, and the, yet... After rook c1, king g1, black has a way to stay out. Rook b1, check there. Bishop c7. Two bishops are trying to dominate the rooks through the past pawn, and yet black's protecting it. If white takes the rook, black will defend. So white does f4. Rook g8, and bishop b5. The secret of being successful in these positions is really in maintaining the pressure. And as soon as Black realized that, he found an opportunity, a factor that makes the difference. The A pawn, <clears throat> which in case White captures, will give Black the chance to take down B7. So White obviously decides to take one of the rooks and collect the pawn. This is a fairly drawish position, though, because White's got two pawns for the bishop for the for the exchange, and Black can never, you know, really do a pass pawn. Even if he plays G5, there will be an exchange. And uh, yeah, in the in the in its comment, <clears throat> uh, the player says that the game was adjourned here and uh, essentially agreed as a draw in the next morning. <laughs> so game four of the parallel universe match between Fish and Karpov was actually a very exciting game. I want to show it to you because this is just overall a pretty beautiful game in which basically White approached the carrot count with the e5 and c4. So many possible ways, this one is just the most aggressive. <clears throat> Apparently black plays knight e7, knight e2, and then knight d7, which resulted in knight g3, bishop g6, and h4. It's, you know, nowadays this line is fairly well known, but back in the old time, this you know, this, this world of h4 was fairly new. And so there is a question of playing h6, f5, h5 or f6, which black responded with h5, creating a more of a weakness there. Yes, not a weakness that it seems like white can exploit, but fairly important. And a big move of pawn to a3 
sets up the threat of c5, which really forces black to engage, while this h5 pawn will become a weakness. This is a big, big move. <clears throat> a move that Fisher would definitely be proud of. Takes, exchange, knight takes to the knight d5, a trade, and bishop e2 targeting h6. The concept of using a weakness like this is not so much in order to win it, but rather to create enough problems to the opponent. And you can see that now white wouldn't really think so much about taking advantage of h5, at least not immediately, which could eventually prove very good for black, you know, like he would take back the pawn and push us down, but rather to consider the development and extra problems that come as a side effect of the weak pawn becomes even clearer. Black could do queen b6, takes, takes, and knight takes h5. And so this is what happens in the game. So what did black do? I mean, apparently, uh, if black just continues quiet, white will come back, solidify the pawn, and stabilize his position, getting an extra pawn. So black chooses to go for a very interesting sacrifice, sacking and trying to destroy the center. There's no much of a great follow-up, yet this endgame looks kind of promising for black with those couple pawns and other pieces if they develop. Now, for example, in case of the exchange, takes, black would quickly develop his own pieces and solidify the control around the center. That's where white plays bishop g5. And now he connects the rooks in order to engage, uh, you know, a powerful position for the rook on the e1 and a couple other of other pieces that come into play, like rook e1, and rook to the d1 in both ways. It's a, it's a good thinking. It's really a good thinking. And uh, the reality is that after bishop g5, we could see that activity is all that matters here, not counting the material as huge. When white plays g3, and he sets up the move of rook to the c1, we realize how difficult that is going to be for black to make any real counterplay. As besides the material disadvantage, he also has to figure out how to deal with a tremendous activity by most of white's pieces. The one thing that is needed is that rook. So white brings it in. You can see that now moves like f6 can now be played due to g4 and then e3 would hang. So you realize that black has to do g6, queen h6, Bishop takes g5, queen takes g5, queen takes g, pawn takes g. And so as soon as black does rook h8, white plays rook h2. Now we realize that black's last chance for counterplay really faded. And ultimately, that knight and a couple pawns are simply in no condition to fight over white's fantastic rook, the king, and uh, the, the few pawns. Black tries to sacrifice for dynamic power in the center. But this really goes nowhere as in, as a result of the couple of nice necessary moves. Black's position simply does fail. And uh, at the rook f8, check, king c5, and a few of these moves, the king and the rook, certainly dominate black's um, pawn that just can't find its way to advance. It's interesting how white maneuvers the king and rook so that they can come together, driving the knight out. And then, of course, those pawns are clearly what white uses. Stopping the pawn right from the back just sets up for a perfect position. The passer catches the black king and an accuracy to hold him down is all that white needs in order to go forward. It's important because like if the king went down on the e3, black would have dealt with the pawn and that would have been a draw. This king and the knight will create a sort of a fortress. So as white plays with king f5, he avoids this having his king support the pawn, and the rook comes near. The knight is just too weak so that he could basically stop the g-pawn from advancing and protect the d. So all white has to do is to find a way to stay away from the, from the knight's fork, collect the d-pawn, and do a powerful maneuver that catches the pawn, attacks the knight, and prepares for a checkmate. So, uh... Basically, the idea is that this this uh, the article says um, that after game fourth, uh, you know, obviously, uh, then Fisher resigned. Uh, like, you know, I think it's Fisher won or something like happened, but uh, it's pretty powerful. Um, 
I uh, Fisher quit after game four. Of course, he was like joking about this, but it could be that those games were uh, just a uh, you know a little hoax. I mean, who believes in parallel universes nowadays? But I believe that you know if we were able to really witness those games happen in our timeline, I think they would have been incredible um, to see. So in any case, I hope that you enjoyed my cover on these brilliant, brilliant games. And um, I do hope that you were able to learn some of this, some, some important principles and ideas from that as well.